Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Active Aging Rehab and Fitness Summit. I'm Dr. Cody Seip. I am the uh, co-founder of the Functional Aging Institute and really excited to kind of be the wrangler of this panel today. It should be interesting and a lot of fun. I think we're going to be dropping some, some big truth bombs on some people and, and really helping things out as we discuss some of the top mistakes that we feel are being made in both therapy, rehab, and fitness regarding how we approach and how we train older adults. And so we have really got a great group with us uh, that, that, that I'm really excited about. So let's go around and make some brief introductions. Evan, let's start with you. I feel like I'm a, like a game show host or something, right? <laughs> Here are our contestants. Let's see who's going to win the $100,000 grand prize. That's right, awesome. Evan. You're up first. <laughs> um, so Dr. Evan Osar from Chicago, Illinois. My wife Janice and I own our own clinic here, Chicago Integrative Movement Specialists. And we also have an online education company. We partner with Functional Aging Institute in training strategies for the older adult. And your background is as a chiropractor, but you've, I don't know, how do you feel about that? You've kind of morphed that so much, right? Yeah, you know what? <clears throat> Excuse me. I started out as a personal trainer. I, I personal trained through college. And when I started in, in Chicago, I went back to personal training just because I wasn't making much money as, as my first couple of years in chiropractic. So it really helped me parlay like movement therapy into what we did as car as we did, as I did as a chiropractor and, and really looked at like, wow, this is, this is actually more effective as training movement. Obviously chiropractic is, is a valuable tool, but it's really a way for me to help people move better. And that's essentially where Chicago integrated movement specialist and integrated movement special certification came from. Yeah, it's really interesting because uh, Dustin and I, we were just talking uh, yesterday when we were, we were doing a, a, a session, talking about these individual fields and how much we need to learn from each other. You know, and I think sure. therapy needs to learn from fitness, fitness from therapy, chiropractor. I mean, it's yeah. just, I think, kind of taking you guys, taking your field individually, but morphing it kind of into the next level to really serve older adults. I think that's really exciting. All right, and Alicia, Alicia Schwipp's with us from West Lafayette. Tell us about yourself. Um, sorry. Um, so uh, during my undergrad, I also uh, was a personal trainer and I continued that throughout physical therapy school. Uh, before I went to PT school, I did an internship with St. Vincent Sports Performance and Strength and Conditioning where I worked with high school all the way to professional athletes. Um, once I graduated PT school, I did an orthopedic residency through Evidence and Motion and I became a board certified orthopedic specialist last June. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, during my journey, I've been out of school five years and I worked at the same company. And at the same time, my husband has also worked from the same company in the last five years. And um, he works at Miracles, uh, which is where Dan Ritchie works. Um, so he's a personal trainer with Dan Ritchie. Um, so I've done a lot of um, communication with those trainers and a lot of education. And we've actually uh, formed a really good relationship between us. So yeah, yeah, that's exciting because we need so much more of that. You know, we need so much more of that collaboration. And kind of in your background, so you're you're not dealing with older adults specifically. You have kind of a broad range of clients that you're you're treating, correct? True, true. Um, so I, I mean, I have a whole range. I see a lot of Purdue students here, a lot of Purdue professors, but I see a lot of geriatric patients as well. So I, I just have a good mixed population. So my view is maybe a little bit different, but I I definitely. Um, work with geriatric patients a lot. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. All right, Dustin Jones. All right. Um, my background, I want, I, my goal is to be like Alicia. I feel like <laughs> what she's doing right now was, was kind of my, my end goal uh, in terms of the world of physical therapy. So I've kind of have a, a sports fitness background, went through PT school. I wanted to work with individuals like Alicia's working with and ended up, uh, you know, getting some experience in skilled nursing facilities and home health. Uh, and really fell in love with working with, with older adults. Um, and so really embraced, uh, you know, that, that setting or those particular settings, uh, which typically, and I don't know if Alicia would ag agree per se, but are some of the least desirable settings in, in the world of physical therapy in terms of home health, skilled nursing facilities, they, they have a lot of stereotypes and biases around that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that really showed me how much we have to offer uh, you know, that demographic and how much we can literally change our lives. So that's been uh, very transformative for me. And so now um, I I'm not in those settings anymore, but they have uh, really changed my life and how I perceive aging and how I perceive uh, older adults. Um, but I'm, I'm teaching uh, with the Institute of Clinical Excellence to other clinicians 
uh, related to, to geriatric physical therapy, and then also uh, running a fitness program called Stronger Life, uh, which is housed within an existing fitness facility across the box. Yeah. Um, so Excellent. experience in all these different areas and, and just trying to bring it together uh, and, and, and blend it in some way, shape or form. Yeah, Thank and I think that's, that's really important because when I think about, you know, my background, I'm, I'm now in academics, I don't get a lot of hands on uh, anymore, but I'm so thankful for the background that I had in which I was able to, to deal with older adults that were in some of those less desirable settings and in, you know, retirement villages and kind of senior centers, kind of care centers versus kind of robust fitness oriented older adults. I think it's really key that you get that diversity and see the diversity across the, the older adult spectrum. I think that's really key. Yeah. So let's jump into some of these nuggets that you guys are gonna drop and why don't we start with Alicia? Let's start with you. Uh, what, is, what is one of the top mistakes that you see uh, are happening with older clients these days? Um, I have a lot of trainers and a lot of friends uh, talk about uh, pain and is a pain okay during exercise? So I think it is a mistake to avoid pain entirely. Um, now, of course, there are different situations, um, acute versus chronic pain. So if someone, uh, you know, sprained their ankle this week or, you know, definitely pulled their back out or threw their back out, um, you're going to do relative rest. You're not going to push them through that. But uh, there's a lot of people that have chronic knee pain, you know, especially as we age, chronic back pain. And um, sometimes pain's a, a pain is okay. So I'll, um, in the therapy world, uh, there's a big push towards pain neuroscience education. Um, it last five or 10 years, it's really been busting and it talks about like how to work with patients with chronic pain and, um, what concepts are important to like educate them on. Uh, for example, uh, somebody that's had pain a long time, uh, just because you have pain doesn't always mean there's tissue damage happening. Um, there are different mechanisms that happen in the brain, um, that kind of sensitize the brain to pain. So sometimes, um, we have to use exercise, you know, motion is lotion. Um, it's the best painkiller on the planet. Um, so just gradually exposing them to exercises that even though they feel pain, uh, just kind of retraining the brain um, so that they know that it's actually not causing damage so that their brain kind of desensitizes to those activities. So it doesn't mean like go hard, go fast, um, but uh, using like low load motor control exercises, body weight, uh, things that aren't scary and grow gradually progressing to things um, you know, that will help them more in their life uh, with carrying, lifting, pushing, pulling, you know, getting on and off the floor. Um, so uh, like graded exposure, graded activity uh, with therapy. I just think it's so important. Yeah, Evan, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this because I know you deal with that a lot because I know I've seen this. I've seen this happen. I've talked to trainers. I can't do anything with this person because everything hurts, right? right. And guess what? Right. Everything hurts them every day of their life. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Absolutely. 100% agree with Alicia. Really great point. And that's actually the, uh, <clears throat> my topic at, at this year's uh, Active Aging Rehab Summit is about pain, posture, and performance. And, and as Alicia alluded to, there's actually three different kinds of pain. And like we used to be like, oh, this is just avoid pain and painful things. And one of the things we want to look at is like the different types of pain that people have. Like there's nociceptive pain, which is your chronic sort of musculoskeletal type pain. Then there's neurogenic. So that's kind of your nerve type pain. And those two types of pain with the right approach work very well with posture, movement, corrective exercise, motor control, as Alicia alluded to. Now there is the nosoplastic type pain, and that's where you start to have the brain type changes. These are your chronic pain patients, especially like your older population. They've been in pain for a long time. So there are nosoplastic or brain, plastic brain changes that occur. And there's exactly as Alicia alluded to, we want to give them some, you know, graduated exposure, lower levels of motor control type training, postural training that, and educate them on the fact that, yeah, not every kind of pain is, you know, it has to be avoided that, that we can work through certain kinds of pain. And, and I, was, I was educating a client, a patient the other day, I was saying, there's, there's basically three areas when we're doing some exercises that you don't want to feel pain. That's your neck, your low back, and your knees. So if we can get, you know, if you feel uncomfortable, no problem. But if you're starting to feel it more in your neck, more in your low back, or more in your knees, that's probably not the right strategy and or exercise. So that's a good key for, for you as, if you're listening to this and you're a fitness professional. Generally speaking, if an exercise increases knee pain, probably not a great exercise right then and there, or back pain or neck pain. But anywhere else, I'm not super concerned about increases in discomfort during an exercise program. 
I'll tell you just personally, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm 50 and um, I, I've never squatted. Okay. Because when I was kind of in athletics as a high schooler, my knees already hurt squatting all, all hurt me. It was terrible. I was tall. And, but a few years ago, <clears throat> I was like, you know, I just feel like I need to, to, to learn these patterns. I think they're important. And I, I can't remember who said it, but they said the comment was squatting doesn't hurt your knees. How you squat hurts your knees. And I kind of took that to heart and started to address my own mobility restrictions and movement restrictions. And it was absolutely right. I went from squatting that really hurt my body to now I can squat and it feels smooth. It feels fluid. It's not perfect. I've got limit. I still have restrictions and limitations. So I've got to know when I try to force myself, my body through those, then I start to have pain again. But I think it's just, it's so important that the trainers have tools to work around and through kind of those, those pain episodes, because almost every older adult is going to have some level of pain. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, Dustin, let's skip over to you. What is your, one of your top uh, mistakes? Oh man, I, I've got several and I'm trying to think of which one to, to queue up. We're, we're probably all on the same page. I'm going to hit all of them. I think I'll speak more to the, the rehab clinicians, uh, but then also I think, you know, the fitness professionals need to hear, hear this as well. Um, but uh, Alicia could speak to this. Many older adults that, that come into like a physical therapy clinic, for example, especially outpatient, uh, you know, community dwelling older adults, it's usually driven by pain. Um, in, in other settings like home health or even skilled nursing facilities, it, it may not be pain related. It may be more function related. And so in, in those settings, especially in home health, there's a big push for functional outcome measures. Uh, so things like, you know, a five time sit to stand test, uh, you know, a timed up and go. Uh, there's several that, that measure strength, measure capacity, uh, balance as well. Um, and so we, we get a glimpse of how someone is functioning and the beautiful thing about the world of, of geriatric, uh, the, the literature in geriatrics is we have some solid evidence to actually support a lot of these outcome measures. It can show, you know, if you get below, uh, let's say 14 seconds on a time up and go, or, or sorry, above 14 seconds, then I know you're, you're at a risk for falling in, in the near future. Uh, there have been some interesting uh, studies to really correlate that to, to dollars in terms of healthcare uh, expenditure based on, you know, how people are performing on some of these tests. And so in, in the home health world, uh, you get drilled with doing these outcome measures and a lot of screens to stratify risk. How, uh, how you know, at risk is this person of functional decline or losing their independence? But in many, uh, especially in the outpatient world, and that's fitness professionals as well, I could see this being an issue. When someone is coming to you for, let's say, their back pain or whatever specific goal it may be, and we don't actually run some of these screens or functional measures, we may not get a total glimpse of the whole story of what is actually going on. So like in where Alicia is, for example, in the outpatient clinic, someone comes to her for low back pain. We're going to focus on the back. We're going to reduce their irritability, try and improve their function. However, what if we did something as simple as a grip strength measure that we know correlates very well to what the future is going to look like for this individual and we identify that they have a massive deficit in their strength that that can incorporate uh, or influence our plan of care to say okay we're going to reduce their symptoms we're going to reduce their irritability all that fun stuff that we typically focus on in the rehab setting but man we need to get this person strong we need to get this person a bit, you know able to to maintain their level of independence uh, and live a high quality of life and so all that to say short to say short and sweet is a lack of screening uh, and leveraging of these functional outcome measures to get a glimpse of someone's picture, you know, and, and assess their risk for functional decline down the road. I think it's a big gap uh, in, I can say it, especially in the physical therapy setting. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think especially in the therapy setting mm -hmm. is uh, to me, the, the especially rehabilitation professionals have a unique opportunity of an interaction with an older adult that is so valuable because not only do you have the opportunity to say, okay, I need to address the issue at hand. It's such an opportunity to say, oh, but guess what? Your trajectory is down and you've got all these other risks mm -hmm. and we miss that, right? Right. We, if, if we don't do the screenings and the assessments, we miss that. And I think it's part of the uh, I'm going to call it, I think there's an ethical issue in healthcare when we allow that to happen. 
You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's like, you know, they had their shoulder pain, they had their back pain, get them back down to a zero or one out of 10. And then what typically happens? All right, you're good to go discharge. But then they, right. they're lacking tremendously in these other areas that, that may even have a bigger impact on, on their life. And, and we, you know, can completely leave it on the table, which mm -hmm. is, which can be a shame. Um, one, of, one of my mistakes was also forgetting just to make therapy and exercises functional, you know, for rehab professionals and for, you know, for fitness professionals. Um, every, God, not every person, but 99% of the patients that I see come in and yes, the, their goal is to reduce pain. The goal is always to reduce pain. But what do you want to do without pain is the question. Oh, yeah. Do you want to go up and down the stairs? Do you want to get on the floor? And um, doing strength exercises is not enough. You can make someone so strong, manual muscle test, they can be five out of five. Um, but if you don't get that patient on the floor, and show them they can do it, they won't believe they can, whether the strength's there or not. If you don't make them do it like they wanna do it, climbing stairs without holding on, yeah. you know, they, they won't trust themselves. So it's about building confidence too, you know? Um, function is everything. No one cares if they're stronger, no one cares if they're more flexible. Ultimately, it's gotta uh, translate to something in real life. Yeah, so. great. I think it's a great point. Again, Dustin, you were talking about this the other day because it's, it's part of that transformation of the mind. Like I mean, oh. basically you said, these people feel like they're badass now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It changes their whole mindset and what they think they can do, but then ultimately the decisions that they make in terms of what they actually do. It's yeah, it's a game changer. All right, Evan, let's shift to you. What do you think is uh, one of your big mistakes that people are making? Yeah, uh, it comes down to two things, I think. And Alicia, you, you actually touched the basis on it a little bit. There is when I first started out in. A, training when I, when I came graduated chiropractic college 22 years ago now and started personal training you know I was back in the late 90s and that's when functional training was all the rage and train everybody like they're an athlete and that's what I did you know I, I started working at East Bank Club of Chicago here in, in this number one money-making club in the country Michael Jordan worked out there Oprah all the, all the who's who of Chicago and that's what I wanted to work with I wanted to work with athletes you know a bunch of the Bulls and Blackhawks players worked there Bears players worked out there and they knew I was a chiropractor, so they're like, oh, yeah, you know, you got, you got knee pain, go, go see Dr. Osa, you, you, know, you got back pain. And what I realized, like, after 10 years of college, after years of, of personal training, I wasn't actually prepared to work with these older adult population. Like, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, let's, let's do some functional exercises. Let's do some, you know, some reaching lunges. Oh, yeah, yeah, that hurts my back. Okay, let's do some, uh, let's do some overhead, uh, you know, squats. And it's like, oh, that hurts my back. And, and, and I, got, I got very frustrated. So I go to all these conferences and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, train your clients like they're athletes. Everybody's an athlete. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. I would come back and train these clients and, and like very few of them ever got better. And, and it really, you know, so I, th I thought it was me. And it wasn't until I started to experience serious shoulder problems myself. I was in the best shape of my life around the age of 30. And uh, I, I started to realize like I was doing all this functional training and three-dimensional training and all this. And, and I realized like, wait a second, something is fundamentally wrong about how we're training, what we're learning about training people like my, my patients are not getting better now i'm breaking down i'm in, I'm in the quote, best shape of my life and i'm physically breaking down something's not right so there's two things that i think fundamentally were were wrong at the time and i still think it's wrong and i said alicia alluded to it number one we over focus on in our industry on strength we think that people being stronger equal equates to being better i'll tell you right now like some of my the most challenging clients and patients I have in my office are the strongest clients. I have a guy that came in, he's a PhD student, squats 700 pounds. He's got chronic low back pain. So I'm like, you know, how much more strength? When you squat 900 pounds, well, you no longer have low back pain. So it's not about strength. It's really about the strategy. And then that's the one thing that if I wish somebody had taught me back then. I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have listened because <laughs> I, I, was, I, was, I was young <laughs> and, and knew it all back then, you know. So it's really about an individual's strategy. It's how they manage their posture and their movement. And it's ultimately what I feel like our, our number one role is as you know, physical therapists, chiropractors, you know, trainers, fitness professionals is to help our client develop a more optimal strategy because that's ultimately what's going to help our clients successfully proceed or progress towards all the things that they functionally want to do. So whether they want to get down on the floor, get off the floor, pick up their grandchildren, climb Kilimanjaro, it's a strategy that they take into it. And, you know, some of these things that we hear our patients say, oh, I have chronic tightness, chronic pain. Um, I can't do the things the, the way I used to be able to do them or as efficiently as I used to be able to do them. Those are all signs that our clients telling us that my strategy isn't as optimal as it can be. So one of the things I wish I knew back then, which I do 
know now, and again, like I literally just learned this recently, like because I'm kind of a slow learner, is it's, it's all about develop, helping your client develop a more optimal strategy and then help them use that strategy to progress towards whatever that functional outcome is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you get Dustin and Alicia, you guys both alluded to that as well. There's, there's, there's things that your patient wants to do. What do they want to do when they're out of pain? What do they want to do as they get stronger? And then tie mm -hmm. everything we do as far as creating a more optimal strategy to that functional goal, but not have that functional goal just be driving everything. Like, let's just get you stronger so that you can climb Kilimanjaro. Let's help you develop a more optimal strategy so that you can successfully progress towards accomplishing that goal. And, and like I said, I, I wish somebody had really stressed that upon me when I first started because it would have saved me years and years and years of, of frustration. <laughs> and I would have been able to help way more patients um, earlier on. So yeah, so that's, that's, a, that, that's the number one thing that I think that we will, you know, I, I think all of us can agree upon it. And that I think we are starting to change the industry but it's a little slow to come because there's still the people training the athletes and all the people doing this the crazy stuff on, on social media that still are, are making the most amount of noise and getting the most amount of likes. So, but, but we're making progress for sure. Yeah. So Dustin, I'd love to hear you kind of talk about this a little bit because, you know, we, when we talk about older adults, especially frail or older adults, we talk about the importance of strength, right. And building capacity and how important that is. But <clears throat> I'm always, in my mind, whenever we talk about this, there's an asterisk uh -huh. in my head, right? Mm -hmm. That I that I, I feel like I need to convey to people because like even like with what Robert Linkle is doing, he, he focuses a lot on strength, but it's not just strength. Yeah, exactly. It's no, strength yeah. in a strategy, right? right? And I think that's what's so valuable. Dustin, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, yeah, the term strength, that, that can be a nebulous term, you know, based on who's who's speaking to it. But I, re I really love what Evan said, because it, it is a strategy. And you know, someone can be very strong and have a strategy that may not be working for them. I think what I think about is building capacity within that strategy. And so, uh, you know, like he uses the word optimal. I love that term, especially in especially I think with a lot of spaces that we're in that we focus a lot on strategies and, you know, you could use the word form, uh, if you will, that, that we have defined perfect form uh, in some way, shape or form for some of these movements, but in the world of older adults, that ain't going to happen for many people. You're, you're going to work within the limitations that you're given. And so it's going to be optimal and it may not look like the prettiest squat or the prettiest deadlift or whatever strategy it may be, but we work within, uh, the limitations that, that are given or, whatever that may be. And then we try and build capacity in that in a gradual manner, typically great exposure, like Alicia and Evan mentioned earlier. Um, but I, I, I think that's where we, we have a lot to offer people, especially when pain is on board. Uh, the, the, yes, we want to get them stronger. We're, we're not saying, not emphasizing strength, but I, it is a gradual progressive manner of building capacity in these, these different strategies or optimal strategies, like Evan said. That, that is absolutely vital. When pain's on board, though, that changes, that changes everything in, in terms of how, what that path looks like. If pain is not on board, then it typically is a, a, a pretty linear progression. Um, and, and Robert spoke to that yesterday. But when pain's on board, it, it's more of like a roller coaster <laughs> in, in a way. Lots of ups and downs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think what's, what's that. important, because this is why in our you know, in, in our functional aging training model, we, we have these six domains that kind of tie into function. It's basically, you know, there, there are other models that talk about different, kind of put their domains together a little bit differently. But, you know, we talk about kind of musculoskeletal, neuromuscular, balance, cardio, you know, mobility, cognitive, all those areas. I think it's important that we build capacity in all those areas. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's important because I think to, to, to Evan's point, I've, I've had older adults themselves that could really knock out some weight and their balance was horrible, their yeah. movement pattern was horrible, their gait was horrible. Mm -hmm. And so even in doing some of these things that we want to get into of, of squats and deadlifts and some kettlebell work and, and that stuff, I think we all agree is, is great stuff in building capacity. I'm always concerned when I see some of these memes or some of these videos of an older lady who walks up to a bar, does a really heavy deadlift and she walks away. And you know what I see? I see the way she walks to the bar and the way she walks away. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that was right. awesome that she was able to deadlift right. 225 pounds. But totally. ultimately, I see capacity in other areas that really need to be focused on, right? For sure. Yeah. If, if a deadlift doesn't improve someone's SPPB or, you know, some of these other functional measures, then 
whatever, you know, like uh, yeah. that, that's what I think is we really need to hone in more on these functional measures. And if a deadlift or heavy squat helps that great. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Lich, I think I interrupted you. I, I was just going to say that I think a lot of times we forget that like mobility and flexibility are precursors to strength. You can only be strong in the range that you have. Um, so I, I know my husband would argue that, um, you know, Alicia, I have 30 minutes with these clients. And if I, if I did all stretching, they never come back to me. Um, so I'm always like, you know, have them come in early, have them warm up before they get to you, do the strength and then give them a little packet with some stretch exercises to do after you're done. And I mean, make a functional talk about how, um, like, uh, older clients that love to golf, you know what I mean? Say, talk about the effects of rotation during golf and how you can't use the hip strength you have unless you have that rotation. Mm -hmm. um, so make it worth their while. Do you know to make them understand the importance of the mobility, even if it's one of those things where they're doing work on their own, but that's just like a part of comprehensive care, whether you're a trainer or whether you're a therapist or whether you're a chiro. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. Evan, limit your comments to under two hours on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good actually well well said i don't need to add anything to that but well, i think it's it's it is it is so important and especially when we look at the aging body that's one of the hallmarks is is people just become more and more restricted uh not only because of age but because of poor lifestyles <clears throat> or even active lifestyles correct yes mm -hmm. that they're doing could be impacting their mobility in ways they don't Absolutely. realize it. So Absolutely. I think it's vital and, and people just feel better when they can move more freely. So I, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's uh, excellent advice. Yeah. Actually, I'll add one thing to that. I knew it. Cody. <laughs> <laughs> um, for some of our clients, exactly to your point, Cody, some of our, cl our older clients, they're super active, right? However, they're doing things that are actually contributing to why they're having issues. Like for example, maybe they're walking 10,000 steps because they, they, they've heard that that's great or they, they, look, they like doing that. But the way they're walking, kind of like you were mentioning, Cody, the way they're walking up to that bar, it's like, wow, your walking actually isn't helping you. Can we pull you off your walking just a little bit, not stop you from walking, but can we give you a strategy to improve how you're walking, maybe decrease how long you're walking to, until you build up the endurance using a more optimal strategy. So sometimes it's just as important what you need to stop your client from doing so that they can actually, you know, sort of, I hate to use the word regress because a lot of our clients will be like, Oh, you know, like, like I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I had a client that I'm doing an online consult with. She was going to physical therapy prior to COVID. She had cerebral surgery for a rotator cuff tears and she literally only had range of motion here. So I initially had to stop her from doing a lot of her physical therapy exercises because they were actually not helping her. And she was very, very upset originally, you know, like I saw her face, like I'm sure she got off the phone and cried, you know, once we were off our zoom call, but now her range of motion is up here, no pain and her face is big smile. And I'm like, you know, it was just kidding with her. I'm like, you know, what's, so what's your, what, what's the moral of the story here? She's like, yeah, just to trust the process. And, and, and that's sort of what I was talking about. It's like, it's the process that sometimes you have to get the back people off just a little bit and just say, and, and what we tell my, our patients is like, just trust the process. I promise you, we will get you to where you want to go. Just trust the process. Sometimes we have to take a step back so that we can progress forward. It's not stopping them. It's just stopping them from doing some of the things that may be contributing to why they can't progress and or feel better in the things that they're already doing. Mm -hmm. But let me let me throw this out because this is this is kind of an aside, but it ties in exactly to kind of what we're talking about. How much does the current, um, I'm going to say, reimbursement process and limitations? How much is that impacting what you're what you're really able to to accomplish with some of these clients? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia, I know you can. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'm going to kind of tie it into another mistake, um, uh, talking about like, uh, the physical, uh, and the physical therapy PT relationship, you know? Um, so, you know, if you don't make functional progress, insurance isn't going to pay for it. It's not, it's not true. Um, or it's true. So 
one thing is, is um, you see all these research studies and I'll give you an example of like tendinopathy and um, in a 2019 uh, systematic review in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, um, they compared uh, surgery results to like sham surgery and physical therapy. And uh, the ultimate recommendation they came up with is that uh, that the patient or the client will need 12 uh, months of loaded exercises before they should even consider surgery. Guess what? I'm not going to get to see them for 12 months. Yeah. You know, I know that uh, in order to progress, once uh, I get everything, uh, like the foundation laid, I can send them to a personal trainer and they can finish it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, reimbursement is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> for sure, for sure. And, and, and so for, and for the folks that aren't familiar with, uh, I guess, in the, the rehabilitative world with reimbursement, it's it's different in each setting. So like how Alicia gets reimbursed in outpatient is different than how uh, physical therapy gets reimbursed in home health. And, and uh, these different settings, ha settings have different models. And it's starting to change now, but for the longest time and still in some settings, we, we, were, we were paid just for doing things. It wasn't based on how they impacted people or, or actual outcomes. It was, it was based on just interventions. And so like skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes are a great example of that. You would have these, uh, you would get paid more if you did more therapy. And so you had an incentive to just do therapy uh, yeah. without showing any fruit of your labor or, or impact mm -hmm. in someone's life. And, and it really uh, was not a great thing. You can imagine people were just in a gym, just doing random activities uh, that weren't effective. And, and so we were incentivizing the wrong things rather than outcomes. I think outpatient, uh, they, they've shifted quicker than some of the other settings in terms of uh, what they're looking for. Um, but we're kind of in the middle of this shift to being paid uh, based on how we're able to impact people's lives rather than us just doing things for them. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So Alicia kind of talking about the <clears throat> relationship with, with a trainer or I'm going to say trainer, program, facility, or trainers, programs, facilities, you know, some, um, some communities certainly have, are running evidence-based programs in, you know, their community centers and, and in other facilities, but talk a little bit more about that. And I, I assume all these mistakes that you're, you're bringing up are all based on your, your experiences with your husband, right? So these are <laughs> all mistakes my husband has made. <laughs> okay. You heard that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so talk about that a little bit more because that, I think that's so critical. In fact, that's really the impetus for this entire summit that we're having is to try to start crossing these, these bridges. Um, and I, I, I hear this constantly. We have trainers that have followed us for years that go to Dr. Osar's lectures. They're really, really freaking good trainers with older adults. And they're like, these therapists will not give me the time of day. Mm. Right. So talk about, how, you know, I don't know, just, just, just talk about some of your experiences with having that relationship. Obviously you've got, you've got an in with an individual that you probably trust and can refer to, but how, do, how do we get that moving forward? Um, yeah. So um, lucky for me, all the trainers uh, that my husband works with, um, I mean, they're, they're higher level personal trainers, um, really good certs, do a ton of education um, and they want to be better. Do you know what I mean? They want to know how to be better. Um, they want to listen to a PT and I want to listen to them because I want to see what they're doing because I pick up stuff from them all the time too. Um, so a lot of the times uh, they come to me when their, their clients have pain. And they're like, okay, um, like shoulder pain, back pain, like how do I modify? What do I do? What do I not do? Um, sometimes it's simple, um, like shoulder patients just doing them education. We do so much pushing and things in, in front of our bodies and our lives to do like two pulls for every push to get scapular work in, to like um, add um, exercises in the transverse plane to make sure you do rotator cuff type strengthening with lat pull downs. Don't do it, you know, behind the head because a lot of times mobility is not there. Do it in front of the body. Um, uh, and just little things for back pain and like the correlation between um, like, like hip weakness and back pain and gluteus medius strength. So uh, just like educating them on the little tweaks to their program or even just modifications, squats, elevating the heels, boom, knee pain is gone. Um, so just teaching them how to modify for their clients is a, a, a big part of what I do with them for sure. 
Um, my husband likes to know a lot of uh, the things I'm learning as far as screening and risk factors. You know, there's a lot more comorbidities in, uh, you know, the aging population. And um, for example, example, there are studies uh, with patients with cancer and they're like, what are the biggest risk factors for cancer? And, um, you know, there's several factors and the more factors you have, the more likely like they have it. So I think it's not only important uh, for us as PTs to know, which we're trained to do, so we know when to refer to a physician, but, you know, they're often seeing personal trainers first. So like, for example, with cancer, age over 50, history of cancer, those are your two biggest risk factors. And then constant pain, night pain, or unexplained weight loss, and that gets a little tricky in the fitness, you know, the fitness realm. Um, but just knowing uh, those things to look for of when maybe you need to refer out to me, or maybe when you need to refer out to a physician. Um, I just, I just think education uh, between us is just so important. So um, I, I, I wrote some notes down on that. Um, but not only is it important just for comprehensive care, but I mean growth, right? We all wanna grow our businesses and um, we can work with each other to do that. We don't have to be competitors. We don't have to be threats, you know? Um, we can take care of our clients and patients together. Mm. What, is, what is kind of the um, overall um, perspective within, I'm gonna say any sort of rehabilitation therapy, uh, whether it's chiropractic care, physical therapy care, occupational therapy, any of these areas when it comes to the fitness industry as a whole? And it, is that a barrier? Hmm. Yeah, I think it goes both ways. I, th I think you have the individuals like Alicia and Dustin that myself who are very open to it. And we also understand that there's people in the fitness industry that don't have the education you know, for like at miracles or the people that have come through our certification. We have a bunch of them here in Chicago. We know that when we refer to them, they're a higher level educated. They're going to be communicate back and forth with us. But we also know that there's a lot of fitness professionals that aren't doing the education. They're, they aren't trying to up level their skill set or their knowledge and not trying to communicate. You know, the, the, like I have a couple, you know, clients that will have personal trainers and I will, I email my patient. I'm like, forward this to your personal trainer. Feel free to have them contact me. And I hear nothing from the personal trainer. So there are different levels of, of fitness professional, just like there's different levels of chiropractors and physical therapists as well. Um, and I think it's important that if you want to get referrals from chiropractors and physical therapists, that you do your due diligence and communicate professionally. You know, I was actually on your, on your guys' mastermind, FAI mastermind, and I was talking to, to one of your, your mastermind members, and I was saying to her, write a letter and, tell, and, and explain to them very professionally how you, you know, ask them how you can be of service to them. Show them how you work. Show them that you do an assessment, that you do a, a thorough progression with them, that, that you're able to work with them and take their recommendations. So show them how you, how you can be of value, show that you, that you are going to be a good communicator and follow up with them. Like every medical doctor I get a referral from gets a letter from me, you know, and, and I know they probably don't read it and they don't care, but it, it shows them that I'm a professional. It shows that I'm, and I stay top of mind to that professional, even though the medical doctor has no clue what I'm saying and they, they, they don't know, but they like the, they, they, they like the fact that I'm a professional and I talk to them like a professional. And I think all of us would agree that, that with that if a fitness professional is working with us or we're referring to you that we want to have that same professionalism that we want to know that because you're a reflection of us whether you work with us as personally or not that we, we want to make sure that our clients our patients are safe we don't want to be treating them for the same thing over and over again because that first the fitness professional didn't follow the right recommendations or or progressions and things like that why do you think that allied health professionals aren't the ones actively seeking out the relationship like why does it always seem like the trainers that are trying to knock at the door, shouldn't a, a therapist be like, all right, I, I got to send these clients on to something. Why, why are they not the ones that are proactive and going, who in my community do I trust that has the education that I can partner with? Why aren't they doing that? I am. Uh... So in the therapy world, there are multiple different types of settings, like in outpatient or, or otherwise. Um, so, um, with my company, I'm not associated with any hospital. I have to work for my referrals. I have to market. Um, and I guess maybe through this process, I've learned the values of community partnership, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of my patients are like, I want to continue and I, I want them to graduate from me and 
uh, only come back to visit. You know, I don't want them back in therapy. So especially those that aren't as motivated on their own and need that like outside um, like motivation. Um, I mean, my first instinct at discharge with discharge planning is like, what can we do to keep this going? Can I send you to someone, you know, uh, like you have more goals. Great. You don't have any pain, but you have goals. This is the perfect person for you. You know, um, just recognizing that if you're really doing your due diligence to take care of that patient long term, like those are things that we should be thinking about, even if we're not now. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. It, it, what When you speak to that and, and then the, the question Cody posed, I think a lot about traditionally, I think in, in our field, especially I can speak for physical therapy in terms of so many of our referrals will come from physicians and we've been trying to court doctors for way too long. I mean, the endless number of lunches of cookies of Starbucks runs <laughs> that, uh, you know, the, the sales team or even clinicians that make to try and, and basically get in bed with these physicians to, to get more and more referrals. Uh, that, that whole model is really starting to, to go by the wayside to see, all right, what, why don't we just focus on the people that we're actually trying to serve? Like we're not trying to serve the doctors. We're not necessarily trying to serve the insurance companies. We're trying to serve people. And if I'm going to serve a person, I'm going to try and, and do all I can in terms of how I market to them direct to consumer instead of to the physician. <clears throat> but then also how, how can I provide an all around service? And a part of that is a team is trying to build awesome relationships with people like Dr. Osar and then Alicia and then other trainers in the community. Um, and, and so it's almost like we're, it, it's, we're starting to see it now, especially a lot of smaller private clinics that they see that they say, okay, I need a team. I'm not going to try and just get, you know, in bed in quotes, you know, with this family practice doc or this ortho uh, physician across town. I need a team. I'm going to market myself direct to consumer and provide the best service I can, knowing that I'm going to need people around me to do that. And I think that mindset encourages those clinicians to get out and meet some of these other fitness professionals, uh, you know, dietitians, for example, uh, establish relationships with the local area agency on aging, like things like that, um, which which is not the norm, I would say, in our in our realm, but. Uh, I think we are starting to see more and more people kind of take that, that mindset. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to piggyback off what Dustin said and, and, you know, physicians aren't going to want to hear this, but they're probably not even listening to this anyway, but <laughs> physicians are part of the problem, right? Because they, they, number one, most physicians aren't healthy, right? They're not exercising. Mm -hmm. They're not watching what they're eating. So they don't even understand the benefits. I mean, theoretically, yes, they understand the benefits of exercise and nutrition, but they're not taking their own advice. I mean, I was sitting on a plane coming back from a conference a while ago, and I was sitting next to a doctor from Cleveland Clinic, like the cardiac respiratory hospital in, in the country. And, and I mentioned the uh, Forks Over Knives, you know, like, oh, you, you must know um, the Forks Over Knives guy, you know, he's from the Cleveland Clinic. He's like, what, what, what are you talking about? You know, I've never even heard of that. I'm like, you work at Cleveland Clinic. I'm like, you're overweight. How do you not know about Forks Over Knives? So, so I think you know, in our communities, we have so many doctors that are so overwhelmed by, you know, managed care and, and, and their patient loads that they don't even take care of their own health so that they don't even understand the, the benefit of getting someone to someone, a, a fitness professional or, or even to a physical therapist or chiropractor. They, they just think it's going to be medicine and, and out the door to the, on to the next patient. So I think, you know, as Dustin alluded to, it's important. And Alicia, you, you were basically saying the same thing. Like, it's important that we as chiropractors and physicians, we create team. We, we get out to the community and create our own team, a network of health mm -hmm. professionals, including fitness professionals. And fitness professionals need to take it upon themselves to find good chiropractors and physical therapists and even medical doctors because they're out there. It just takes a little while to find them. Like I literally, I go, I go as much as I can. I go to all my, my clients' physical therapy appointments, you know, just to meet the physical therapist, the, the, you know, um, orthopedic surgeons. And most of the orthopedic surgeons, surgeons, they have zero time for me. They literally don't even recognize me in the room or, or acknowledge that I'm in the room with, with my patient. 
but every once in a while, they will, and they'll refer patients to me. So I'm not looking for all the doctors who refer to me. I just need a good handful that understand and appreciate what I do and what I'm able to offer. And, and that's what I'd say to fitness professionals and even other chiropractors and, and, and physical therapists is you're not looking for every doctor to refer to you or to build a network. You just mm -hmm. need that, that, that strong group of five, maybe 10 at the most individuals in your community that you can refer to and develop your team and network with. And you're, you're going to have more business than, than you ever know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you, when we first started Miracles Fitness, um, we were getting a, a good flood of, of older clients that we weren't marketing to, right? And we, and, but we noticed the, they kept having the same physician. And it was, it was this one female geriatric physician in town who ran her practice out of her home. Mm -hmm. We had no direct contact with her at all, but she saw what we were doing loved it as like th that's what I, that's what I want all my patients to do and just started streaming people to us so then of course we were like hey we got to meet you thank you so yeah. much for but she's like well why isn't everybody doing this you know it was really yeah. interesting that's great awesome dog and I do feel like uh doctors they love they love to you know tell patients the correlation between uh you know BMI and, and pain but they don't tell them what to do about it <laughs> It would be really great if you lost weight, your knee probably wouldn't hurt, and that's the end of the story. <laughs> right. It's not like the it's not like the, the patients and the clients don't know that. Do you know what I mean? Like that's right. well knowledge, you know, that doesn't help them. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, so what other mistakes do you guys have burning in your brain that you want to get out before we uh, wrap this up? Mm. I, probably I, I, oh, oh sorry. Go ahead, Evan. You got it. Oh no, I was, I was gonna say exactly to the point our, our last point here is like not making collaborations sooner you know like like i i worked with a medical doctor early on so, and he, he he just happened to know you know he was happened to be somebody that I'm, I'm actually working out with him tomorrow he's become a good friend of mine and i, I think it's it's imperative not even i think it's imperative that, that you create your, your network so that your clients number one have see you as that professional if, you, if you're a fitness professional so they see you as a as a professional and that you you start to work and have that network of individuals that you're part of the healthcare team because one of the things we've seen during COVID you know that that people just don't see fitness as essential yeah. and and it, mm. there's nothing more essential right now you know your medical professional your chiropractor your physical therapist and your health and your fitness professional so I think again and one of those things I wish I'd learned earlier on is you know, just develop those, those, those relationships as early, as quickly, and nurture those relationships. Don't just show up and say, hey, I'm a local fitness professional or I'm a local chiropractor. No, like once you, do, once you get that in, in the door, just keep nurturing, provide value to that individual so that not just, just asking for referrals, but provide value to them. Give, show them how you can be value to their patients and their practice as well. Yeah, good point. That, that's a that's a great point, especially when you think about some of the uh, influences that we can have on on the clients that we work with and how other providers can have uh, the influence on, on those individuals. Uh, Justin Dunaway, he teaches with, with the Institute of Clinical Excellence. And he has a saying uh, related to his persistent pain course. He always says beliefs and expectations are the foundation on which outcomes are built. And he, he really speaks to a lot of the research showing that you know, what people are expecting or what they're believing. And Alicia mentioned this uh, with the sham surgery study mm -hmm. is ultimately going to impact, you know, their, their outcomes and, and what we see. And so with that team that, that you nurture, that you continue to collaborate with, there's nothing more powerful than when you have a physician that is going to hype up Evan or me or whatever fitness professional and vice versa to where, you know, Evan's going to refer uh, you know, a client to a physician saying, all right, this family doc across town is absolutely amazing. They're going to really change your life. Just that relationship where we are building those positive beliefs and expectations when everyone is doing that together. I mean, you, you can change someone's life uh, and how they perceive themselves. Uh, but that is not normal. I mean, I think most of my experiences with the exact opposite where, you know, the, the, the referring, uh, you know, physician says, all right, you can go to PT, you can try it out for a few weeks. Right, right. We'll see what happens, whatever. We'll probably need surgery anyway. And not, not every doctor does that, but that's a common occurrence. Sure. And, you know, we're already, 
working out of the hole before I even see the, see the individual. So I think that that team that's on the same mindset, that's intentionally building those expectations uh, is, is super. Yeah, Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. All right. Well, I am going to end us with one of my mistakes that I think that I see that's overarching through a lot of our conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest mistakes, therapy, rehab, fitness across the board people are making with their older clients is not believing that their older clients are going to get better, that they mm. can get better, that their life can be awesome. It's basically a pervasive ageist mindset that really colors our entire approach. And it, it falls into what those beliefs and expectations, right? If we don't have beliefs and expectations that this person can be better and awesome and at 90 be doing great things, we are not going to approach them and, and give them our best, right? And we're not going to share that positivity with them because trust me, they're doubting themselves. They're looking yeah. around and seeing other people going, man, what, what's my life going to be like in, in five years? This is not looking good. So I think there's a huge ageist, pervasive mindset that, that is coloring a lot of what we do. What are your thoughts on that? Great. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well said. Nothing else to add to that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Well, Alicia, glad you got back for the, uh, for the end here. Sorry that you knocked <laughs> off there for a second. So let's, let's wrap up. I think this has been awesome. I think these are just great conversations that we need to have and that we need to share with lots of different professionals um, for, for sure. So let's, I'm going to give each of you kind of a, a 30, 60 second uh, wrap up, kind of, kind of put your, your final kind of nail in the coffin here um, as we end up with kind of the, the last little wrap up piece of advice or suggestion that you have for our viewers. Evan, let's start with you. Awesome. I would just say, number one, educate yourself. Number two, you know, enroll and work on enrolling your older population because as Cody said, it's never too late to get started. It's never too late to make changes. And finally, empower your older clients. They need empowerment, especially now in social isolation more than ever. So even whichever environment you're working in, whether it be online, virtual, uh, or in person, just keep empowering your clients. Let them know that somebody out there who believes in them and has a strategy for them and keep making those, those connections with other health professionals. Okay, Alicia. Um, so, uh, build relationships and keep learning. Um, that's the only way you're going to be able to provide comprehensive care and really take care of your patients and clients. Um, think about their goals and what they want to do, um, and take little tiny steps towards bigger goals and, um, show them the way. I know these are big overarching concepts, but, um, I mean, it all involves small, small steps. So, yeah. Dustin, beautiful. Yeah, when you said show them the way, Alicia, like that, I love that. Just the we we really serve as guides, you know, for for our, our clients. We're trying to guide them to their goals, to health, to longevity, whatever their their goal is. And and I think along that, we we have our own skill set, and we're gonna you know, take them down that path. But we're gonna need help. We're gonna need a team. We cannot do everything. We're going to need the Evans, the Alicia's, the Cody's on, on our same side that speaks the same language, uh, that has the same mindset to, to help guide these people to where they want to go. Uh, and that, I think that's a big thing that I'm learning. Uh, and then I think, you know, we spoke to this, you know, throughout this conversation that, that can really impact people. Um, for those of you that are listening, if, if you really want to, to upskill yourself and, and get more education and keep moving forward as a, as a fitness professional, I would definitely recommend uh, Dr. Evans course, uh, integrative corrective exercise instructor. You have like three levels of that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yep. a great course. We've had people take it very in depth. Uh, for those of you that are that are in physical therapy, um, definitely Dustin's course through the Inter uh, Institute of Clinical Excellence, which is modern management of the older adult. And I went to one of those workshops. Good stuff. Love that there. And you can also check out the functional aging specialist course that we offer through FEI. Again, just keep moving forward, I think is, is really a key. Well, thank you all for sharing uh, your time with us. It was, it was just in, invaluable. I loved it. This is just great stuff. So, and all of you that are, that are watching, thank you. Hope you are enjoying the Active Aging Rehab and Fitness Summit uh, and can come back with us again soon. So thanks guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. Good chatting y'all. Likewise.
Yeah.